started. Um, why don't you introduce our speaker to, for today? We, we told you Major D Don Pfefferman is speaking. He's a world-renowned speaker in terms of uh, Israel's security situation and has served many positions in the uh, high intelligence units, I understood, in the uh, Ramatkal, Chief of General Staff, or advisor to the Chief of General Staff. I'm sure I'll tell you everything about it. So no further ado, Major Dan Pfefferman, thank you for coming. Yes, like I said, I'm, I'm a touch under the weather, so if I'm uh, blowing my nose or sneezing, you're going to have to excuse me. Um, I'll talk a little bit till we set up the projector, because there's some uh, maps and pictures. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, uh, and then what we're going to talk about today. Um, so like I said, my name's Dan, uh, and I recently retired from the IDF at the rank of major. I was lucky enough to hold positions there in the, uh, the Matkal, the general staff, where I was a foreign policy strategist and advisor. I worked on a whole bunch of national security issues, uh, mostly U.S.-Israel relations, right, so the strategic, uh, the hardcore security relations between the United States and Israel. Uh, and I worked on <coughs> almost every other major national security issue you can think of. Uh, I was Benny Gantz's uh, assistant when he was the deputy chief of staff, uh, which, was, which was a thrill ride. And my last position in the army, I was the commander of an intelligence unit where, I'll just say, we uh, worked on Iran. Um, you can imagine the rest of that part. Um, since then, <laughs> since I left the army, hold on a second. Since I left the Army, I've been uh, consulting to private intelligence companies, I've been uh, writing, researching, speaking, and I work at a think tank in Jerusalem, uh, a research institute, where I study the uh, anti-Israel movement, right? So I don't know if you watch the news and you see uh, people holding signs that are you know, very much against Israel or accusing Israel of all sorts of, of nasty and mostly untrue things. Uh, I research uh, what that means and how to fight it. And uh, I, advise, uh, I advise Jewish organizations and I advise the Israeli government on what to do about it. I live in Rehovot, not far from here. I've lived here for uh, coming on 11 years now. Married, got a few kids. Um, so that's me in a nutshell. I'll talk about mostly Israel's situation in the region, in the Middle East. Uh, I don't know what everyone's level of knowledge is, what everyone's level of background is. You guys are in high school, is that what I was told? Post high school. Post high school. Post high school. Okay, I was going to say, a lot of beards here for high school kids. <laughs> okay. Um, post high school, and pre yeah. what? Pre college, pre army. Pre college, pre -college. Pre -college. And what kind of program? Like how long are you guys here in Israel? Year two. Year two. Year two. Very cool. Very cool. Where, where's, where are people from? Jersey. All over. Seattle. All over, all over Seattle. United States. Virginia. Virginia. Yeah, in Canada. Canada. Memphis, Tennessee. And Canada. <laughs> well, I like the in Canada. All right. All right. I grew up in Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're in Indiana? Uh, and father. All right, what part? Indianapolis. Indianapolis. I'm from South Bend, up north. Ah, uh, that. So. <laughs> good stuff, good stuff. Um, and uh, so we'll talk about Israel's position in the Middle East. <coughs> I'm going to try to keep it kind of general because I don't know where, where everyone's knowledge level is. Um, if there's something that you don't understand, you didn't have heard of, you want me to talk more about, feel free to raise your hand and, uh, and I'll call you and, and we can do that. Um, if there's something that you have a question that you want me to talk more about, um, feel free to ask. And uh, yeah, let's keep it, you know, keep it light, keep it uh, <coughs> more casual. Um, all right, I'll start without the presentation, without the projector. Anymore. So, what I'd first like to explain to people is that from the eyes of an Israeli decision maker, excuse me, it's very important to realize that when, when we, right, when we as Israel, as Israeli decision makers, look at the region and look at all these security threats and challenges, you have to remember in the back of everyone's head are a few important events. And the first one is the Holocaust and 
and then all of Israel's wars, okay? And most of those wars were very painful, very bloody, and the chance that Israel could have been wiped off the map in the first few of those wars was very real. That sounds like ancient history. It sounds like something from a textbook maybe you read when you were a kid, but when you're here in Israel, and even the most serious people in the army and the government really do, if they don't say it out loud and they don't think about it, it's in the back of their minds. Um, and this is very important when considering how decision-making process and how these various threats around the region are made. Now, we look around the neighborhood and we see a lot of threats and it's constantly changing, right? We see the Palestinians uh, with the stabbing attacks that you're seeing on the news all the time and Hamas with the rockets and the tunnels. We see a civil war in Syria. We see Hezbollah, uh, who also has a lot of rockets. Um, we see Iran with the nuclear program, right? We, see, we look all around the region. We see a lot of threats and challenges. And the, the idea is to make sense of it and to craft some kind of coherent answer to how do we as Israel, as a nation, respond to all of these things, right? So that's kind of what we're going to look at today. Well, the first thing I want to talk about, generally, are the top three things that are affecting Israel in the Middle East today, okay? So not necessarily in the most important order, but, but think, if I had to pick three things that are affecting Israel, three dynamics, this is what I would pick. The first is the Palestinians, right? Any way you look at it, any way you want to describe it, that's the closest thing to us and the one that affects us on a daily basis. So from the Palestinians, we have two connected but separate things that are affecting us. One is the political side of the Palestinians who are currently trying to wage some sort of diplomatic war against Israel uh, in all sorts of international organizations, the United Nations, the International Criminal Court, anywhere they have a chance trying to put pressure on Israel from the outside. Okay. And on the other hand, we have what we're seeing from the Palestinian street, these stabbing attacks or these car attacks, these near daily terrorist attacks, the vast majority of which are not organized. By not organized, I mean there's no one masterminding these, picking up a phone and saying, Ahmed, go stab a Jew in where you are, and you go stab a Jew where you are. These are uh, mostly, for the most part, very frustrated, brainwashed, and angry young Palestinians who decided that they're going to become a hero. Uh, and we've seen this since September. And this is definitely having an effect on Israeli society and how Israel interacts with the region and the world. The other one are, is currently U.S. Israel relations, okay? Um, I don't know if you guys follow this or not, but and, uh, I'm gonna preface what I'm about to say. I mean nothing as a criticism of uh, this government or that government or this American president or that American president. I'm just pointing out trends. The current American <coughs> government and the current American president fundamentally changed its relationship with Israel from the previous two presidents. And this combined with the fact that the two leaders of Israel and the United States don't get along on a personal level has led to a lot of friction. But beyond that personal friction, which people like to you know, blame Netanyahu or blame Obama, it's, it goes much deeper than that. And that the relationship between the two countries has changed fundamentally. And this is something that both countries are trying to still figure out what that means. Everything I'm saying, I'll talk more about in depth later, certainly if you have questions. And the third one is Iran, okay? So Iran is Israel's biggest enemy in the region, biggest rival in the region. It's the only powerful country trying to fight Israel right now. <coughs> and Iran has a nuclear program, right? So you watch the news uh, over the summer, over all of last year, there was a big debate in Israel, certainly in the United States and much of the world, uh, whether to accept the Iran deal or not accept the Iran deal. I'll talk about what that means. But it had a major effect on Israel. If we go more broadly and talk about the big things affecting the Middle East and not just Israel, so we can talk about America, right, uh, under the foreign policy leadership of this current administration, of President Obama, reassessing its role in the world, 
saying America's role in the world should be and will be different than what it was just a few years before under Bush, maybe under Clinton. While that happened, a gentleman by the name of Putin, the president of Russia, Russia. you guys are advanced, uh, <laughs> decides he's going to come into the region for all sorts of reasons that we can discuss and, and flex his diplomatic and mostly military muscles. We have, because of America's changing role in the region and because of how it affects Iran, which we just talked about, a rise in radical Islam. The most famous of these groups is known as ISIS. ISIS. Daesh, very good. Uh, Daesh, um, a new and very strong and very confident political radical Islam, more radical than anything we've seen, and more political than any of the other radical Islamist movements, and it's taken advantage of the vacuum that was created by America pulling out, by Iran becoming strong, by civil war in Syria, by Iraq having fallen apart. And it took its chance and said, we're going to rise up and create the Islamic Caliphate, the Islamic Empire, once again. <coughs> and the third major dynamic shaping the Middle East today is, on the one hand, a resurgent Iran in the face of the nuclear deal. Right? The nuclear deal, while limiting Iran's <coughs> nuclear program, <coughs> has allowed Iran to uh, become a lot more aggressive and confident and free for all the other stuff it does, which is not nuclear, but it's just as dangerous, certainly for Israel, certainly for American interests, and certainly for most other people in the region. And what that has done is led to a coalition of the Sunni states to rise up, led by Saudi Arabia, and fight back against Iran and Iran's influence. You guys know the difference between Sunni and Shia? Anyone yeah, know yeah. the difference? Yeah. What's the difference? It has to do with the acceptance of uh, succession of Muhammad. All right. That's the roots of it, exactly. And what that means today is that, I don't want to say half, because numerically they're not half and half, but Sunnis don't see Shias as true Muslims, Shias don't see Sunnis as true Muslims, and there is a lot of animosity between them. Okay? The uh, Hav deal, you can say, comparison, yeah, I don't know, uh, two streams of Judaism in totally different ways, right? They, they come from the same source, but you know, you can say Catholics and Protestants, or you can say any religion that has a deep and fundamental split, right? They both believe in Muhammad, they both believe in the Quran, but they went very different ways since then. So it doesn't have an issue. Uh, actually, it does. Um, over here. Awesome. Has it been up here? No, I won't do it. I'll take one second just to set this up, and you guys can see cool pictures and maps. Is anyone here planning on making Ali after this, or are you guys all going back to the States? I might make Ali after this. Hands up, guys. Hands up. You can deliver it also. I'm sure you guys have talked to a lot of uh, soldiers and people who have made Ali after, but if you have any questions later also about the Army and you know, what it's like to be uh, an Ali Khadash or a lone soldier, happy to answer questions like that as well. I'll keep talking until this gets settled. So, I'm going to further break it down, but stay general, <coughs> and look at how Israel's doing from my perspective. If we look at domestic security and foreign policy, right? It's a nice way to look at it and get a nice overview. And I change this every time I give a lecture because things change here really fast. Um, Okay, so just to get an overview, from a domestic standpoint, right, very quickly, we got some good things, the gas reserves that are finally going to, uh, they're already coming online, but they're going to come online even more, the economy is doing fairly well, 
the democracy is always boisterous, but we have elections, we have a functioning government, things are generally good. We do have tensions uh, as far as income inequality, right? And if you recall, I don't know who here recalls the 2011 economic protests and how even in the current elections there are two new Knesset parties and everything they want to do is make things better for the working class and the middle class. What are those parties? Kulano and Yeshatid. Okay. We have, uh, I don't know if you can tell what that middle picture on the bottom is. That's a slide from the Im Tirtzu campaign to um, call anyone on the far left a mole. Um, my own political opinions aside, I think any kind of delegitimization from the left to the right or the right to the left is dangerous. And it, it, it uh, prevents you know, a more uh, academic or a more productive discourse between right and left. And I think, I think in any society, no matter your opinions, I think that's an important one. And right now, we're seeing really high tensions between the far right and the far left in Israel. And of course, uh, tensions between Arabs and Jews started over the Temple Mount, uh, turned into violence, turned into protest. These are things, the overall, I'd say, the good <coughs> things or the bad things, um, pretty even. From a security standpoint, I want to make one super important point, and I, think, I don't think it's stressed enough. Right, there's pictures of planes and tanks, what we call conventional uh, military weapons, okay? Israel has no, for the first time in its history, has no conventional military threat. I said it quietly, but it's a big deal. There is not any country whose army can honestly threaten Israel today. It doesn't exist. And that's huge. In the region? In the region, sure. Did you say Iran is the biggest enemy? I'll talk about Iran. Their conventional military is actually very weak, very outdated, and they're really far away. Right? So in 1948, we become a state. Egypt, Syria, Jordan, and Iraq, who doesn't even border us, all send their conventional militaries. They send their planes, their troops, their tanks to try to attack and destroy Israel. <coughs> 1967, we preemptively struck Egypt, destroyed their air force. Then we had major tank battles. We had uh, fighter jet battles with Syria, right? We fought Jordanian troops all throughout Israel. These are what's called conventional military battles, right? Planes, tanks, warships, major troop formations. This is how you conquer a country. This is how you conquer an enemy. This is how you defeat their capability to defend themselves. When Saddam Hussein was taken down by the United States military in 2003, and then when Syria went into a civil war in 2011, Israel has no more conventional enemies. Egypt is no longer an enemy. Jordan is no longer an enemy. Lebanon's not really a country, right? Syria doesn't exist as a country anymore. Saudi Arabia has secretly been a, I don't want to say ally, but we've been on the same page for a long time. And there's no country in this region with an army that can threaten Israel. And that's huge. It's really huge for our national security, for our existence, physical existence and uh, for national security budgets and force buildup, right? Force buildup is how you build your army for future threats, okay? You have to look at the region, you have to say, what is this region? What are my threats gonna look like in five, 10, 15 years time? Am I gonna have a country that can honestly threaten me? And the answer right now is no. By the way, when Egypt, I don't know if any of you remember, uh, when Mubarak in Egypt was overthrown in 2011, and after the revolution came into power an Islamist government, there was serious thought in the general staff where I was at the time, is this new Islamist Muslim Brotherhood president of Egypt going to become anti-Israel? Egypt has a massive army. It's all American. It's all a very advanced, very American army. Is Egypt going to become an enemy once again after 30 years that it wasn't? Luckily, it wasn't. And that guy was overthrown as well. And the new president is very quietly pro-Israel. That said, that said, that's a picture of Hezbollah on the top right there. Things can change very quickly, right? Um, 
Why Hezbollah? Because they're one of our most potent enemies. I will tell you that it is the most powerful, most well-trained, most well-armed non-state army in the world today. Okay, they have capabilities well beyond most countries in the world as far as military capabilities, but they're very busy fighting in Syria. Okay, so if Hezbollah has five, 6,000 highly trained ground troops, uh, about a third of those have been killed in Syria trying to defend the Syrian regime. And the rest of them are fighting tooth and nail in the civil war in Syria. And the last thing they want to do is have a war with Israel. So even amongst our most serious non-state, non-conventional threats, the biggest one is very busy right now. That's a big plus. What's the minus? <coughs> so the bottom left picture, can anyone recognize who those guys are? Hamas. 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 Right, the green, the green is Hamas. While Hamas hasn't attacked us since two summers ago, or one and a half years ago, they're very deterred. Things could always escalate very quickly. Right? Hamas says, in 2014, Hamas attacked Israel, not because it thought it could get anything, but it was trying to suck Israel into a war in Gaza, which would then draw the rest of the countries in the world in a war against Israel. It was a very desperate attempt because they're not doing so well politically in, in Gaza. And they can decide to do it again. They know the price. They know it's not popular. They know they can't win. They know they're not going to achieve anything. But for them, it's a way to get pressure off their back by positioning themselves as the big defender of the Palestinian people. Secondly, we talked about the near daily terror attacks that we're having here. <coughs> well, this is not a strategic threat, right? The overall murder levels in Israel, even with all these terrorist attacks, are far lower than than most countries in the world, certainly any big city in the United States, okay? But it's a nuisance, it's, you know, you gotta keep an eye over your shoulder. It changes how we approach certain things, it changes how we, you know, have to have security set up in certain places, and it's something that we have to think about it. And over there in the right, anyone recognize the guy in the picture next to the missile? Say it again? Ali Khamenei. Very nice, you can pronounce it right. Speak Persian? Yes. I could tell. Uh, uh, most people butcher that pronunciation. Right, so we talked about Iran and how, on the one hand, no, they're not a conventional threat. They haven't been. On the other hand, they are an unconventional threat and a major unconventional threat. And we'll talk more about Iran later, but they do that in a few ways. So one is the nuclear program, which for now was put on ice. Not for long, but it's put on ice. They have a major ballistic missile program. And should they want, they could fire ballistic missiles at Israel or anywhere else in the region that they want. And they support terror groups all throughout the region. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, diplomatically, things are actually starting to get a little interesting here. So, I'll start with the bad and I'll, I'll go to the good. Uh, I don't know if it's so bad, but as I said, the changing relations with the United States have caused a lot of confusion in Israel. And looking at the political trends here and looking at the political trends in the United States, don't see them getting significantly better in the meantime. Um, and, and this has a major effect on our overall diplomatic standing in the world and our relationship with our uh, strongest and most important ally. Yeah? Uh, the pro-Israel president gets elected in mm -hmm. 2016. Will that help a lot? A pro-Israel president gets elected in 2016, it can help, but, okay, and that but is very important. It depends a lot on, um, it depends a lot on, on who's here, which is supposedly going to be Netanyahu, that doesn't seem to be changing any soon, and the dynamic with the Palestinians. Um, and how much the government here is willing to at least show that it's trying to make an effort for a peace process, which no one really believes in anymore, including in America. Um, but the bigger issue is, is not the president. What's happened in America, and I'll open a big parenthesis here, what's happened in America over the past eight years is while Israel has shifted to the right, right, Israel has become more right-wing, more religious, America has shifted to the left. And in that shifting to the left, in America, 
the tone on Israel has changed significantly. Yeah. Left religious wise or left politically? Both. America has become more secular and more leftist politically <coughs> than 10 years ago. Okay, significantly. Um, now, at the same time, the right in America has shifted further to the right. And I'm sure you guys have read this. Israel, which used to be a bipartisan issue in the States, has become a partisan issue, meaning the right in America really support Israel more than ever. The left in America less support Israel. And everyone seems to be OK with that, if we're judging by the fact that it hasn't come up more than a couple times during all these presidential debates. So what used to be a battle of who's more pro-Israel, the left is trying not to talk about Israel as much as possible. And the right has realized that Israel is now their issue. And that leaves a problem, by the way, with people in America who are pro-Israel, but on the left. Right, they're torn, and especially with the American Jewish community. The, the mostly non-Orthodox American Jewish community, who tends to be pro-Israel, but liberal on most other issues. And that's a big parenthesis, and, and we can we'll come back to that. But the overall answer is it could help, but there's a deeper fundamental shift of who's in the White House. So we have that. We have the Palestinians. We talked about their diplomatic campaign against Israel. Uh, I will say that right now nobody's really listening to that because there are a lot more pressing issues in the world in the Middle East. Syria right now is should be and is the far more pressing issue. And we have the anti-Israel campaign around the world, BDS, right? Uh, we can talk about that later. Um, but that is something I will say, though, it's not as big and powerful as you would expect if you only read Jewish and Israeli newspapers. But it is a threat that Israel and the organized Jewish community is paying attention to and needs to pay attention to. But there are some plus sides. <coughs> so while I mentioned changing relationships with the US, there's a picture there of Chief of Staff Eisenkot shaking hands with who I believe is Dempsey, uh, the American uh, Joint Chief of Staff. The security relationship, right, security relationship between Israel and the United States is stronger than ever. And this has been a, a, a deliberate policy of the Obama administration saying, we're going to support Israel militarily, intelligence, military, more than ever. But we're going to be really critical on Israel diplomatically. So that's why America is in both the plus and the minus. Yeah? Uh, what does it accomplish by doing that? What has it accomplished? Yeah. That means that we have the hardware. No, no, I'm saying from the American perspective, why would they do that? Oh, the short answer is that there is competing theory in American foreign policy about how to get Israel to do what it wants. The general American interest, <coughs> and this is true for the right and the left in America, has been a, a peace deal, a two-state solution between Israel and the Palestinians ever since 48. <coughs> Some American administrations have been more pro-Israel in their guts, in their kishkis, right, the kishki test. And some have, have not been. Uh, overall, I'm going to say that the American public is overwhelmingly pro-Israel and has been for decades, even before there was a state of Israel. Okay? The deep thinking in, in America, right, white Protestant America, was to support the return of the Jews to the homeland ever since before there was even an America, since the 1770s, since the 1700s. Okay? So something deeply ingrained in, in Protestantism. And they read the Bible. They see that the Jews are the people of the Bible. This goes far deeper than politics. But there is a strain, the very we call it the realist strain in American foreign policy, right? And we saw them in in 1948, telling President Truman at the time, "Don't support establishment of the state of Israel because you're going to upset the Arabs." And there's a lot of Arabs. There's only a few Jews. There's no way they can win the war. And we need the Arabs, we need oil, right? This is when America was becoming massively industrialized. This is when the West realized that there was a lot of oil in the region. This is 22 countries throughout the Arab world, even more Muslim countries. And if you support Israel against the Palestinians or against the Arab world, you're going to upset a whole lot of people you need on your side from a cold, calculating perspective. 
The other strain said we need to support Israel because it's our moral right, and we're also just a few years after the Holocaust, which weighed really heavily on the consciousness of certain American decision makers. Um, and since then, that tension between support Israel, it's the right thing to do, as to that it's a democracy, right? Uh, it's, it shares a lot of the same ethos and values uh, as in the American story. Um, versus the, we're going to piss off the Arabs stream of thinking. And we can go president by president and actually see what kind of presidency there was. The State Department, who's in charge of foreign policy, has generally been more of the pro-Arab camp. They say we need to keep better relations with the Arab world. And presidential advisors, maybe the Defense Department, uh, have argued for the, we need to stick by our allies camp. What has been proven over the years, right, and uh, Dennis Ross writes this in his latest book, is that the camp that said we need to distance ourselves from Israel, be critical from Israel, has been proven wrong, time and again. Because in the Arab world, that didn't buy the United States more credibility. In fact, the opposite. The Arabs looked at the United States and saw it abandoning one of its allies. Even if it's an ally they don't like, they look at the United States and say, if it can abandon its allies so easily, it can abandon us so easily. And it's not willing to flex its power in the region. So we don't need to abide by the United States uh, wishes or the United States grand vision. Um, so I am of the persuasion that that line of thinking has not worked for America. Um, many of the current advisors in this American administration do hold by that line of thinking. They think they needed to pressure Israel to gain credibility with the Arab countries um, and to be able to advance a related set of policies with Iran hasn't worked out for them so long. I don't think they're willing to admit it. It's like playing two, two sides of the same coin sort of thing. Yeah. Um, <coughs> relations with China and India, I'm not going to go into it, but they've very recently and very suddenly become huge. Um, economically and increasingly also diplomatically. And these are two countries that were very hesitant to have relations, especially open relations with Israel, because again, they felt that it would harm their relations with the Arab and the Muslim world. Now, both of those countries, China and India, who are the two biggest countries in the world, are massive oil consumers, and a lot of the oil in the world comes from the Arab and the Muslim world. And so they were upset, or they were, sorry, they were cautious for a long time to have two good relations with Israel, thinking it would affect their standing in the Middle East. They both realized recently that that's not the case. Having strong relations in, with Israel doesn't affect your relations in the Middle East. And so we've seen a very serious warming of ties between Israel and those two countries over the past uh, few, literally just the past few years. Arms deal? Sorry? The arms deal? So arms deals is trickier. Um, there are much bigger arms deals with India, okay. who since the fall of the Soviet Union has been an American ally. We ha have to be much more cautious with China because China is seen not as an enemy, but certainly as a future enemy, certainly current competitor of the United States for global power. And uh, in the 90s, there was actually an attempt by Israel to sell uh, a massive uh, arms deal. It was a radar deal, and I think a fighter jet to, to China. And uh, Israel got in a lot of trouble with the United States uh, over that. So as far as arms to China, very limited, very cautious. There, it's more economic ties. But with India, there has been a lot of arms sales, a lot of uh, cooperation and research and development, and, and, uh, and that is with the blessing of, uh, of the Americans. And the last piece of the diplomatic puzzle, that's the King of Saudi Arabia right there. As I said, because of a resurgence in Iran, we have a lot of interest currently in common with, the Saudi, with Saudi Arabia, with the Gulf states, Egypt and Jordan, what we call the moderate Sunni countries. Um, when we say moderate, I should we should change that because it's really the status quo, right? They want the region to stay as it is, and Iran leads a radical camp that wants to change. So it's not moderate like you know, they're 
nice, moderate guys, but they don't want the region to fundamentally change. Yeah. Uh, yeah, why do the Saudis like us uh, more than Iran, so to speak? Why would Iran dislike <coughs> Israel? I mean, they're both uh, Muslim, you know, right. Sunni Shia, but I don't see why it won't be different. Okay, good question. So, um, Saudi Arabia <coughs> sees itself as the natural leader of the region, okay? It has custodianship of the Muslim holy sites, the two biggest, most important Muslim holy sites in Mecca and Medina. Uh, since it discovered oil, it's also been one of the wealthiest countries, certainly in the region and, and the world. And it has taken on a role of leadership uh, within the region. It has a vision for the region, and it likes the fact that it's the dominant power. It can tell other <coughs> countries what to do. It can influence policy. For years, it was hostile to Israel. It never actually attacked Israel, but being the most Muslim country that it was, uh, over the years, it came to realize that Israel um, is a status quo power. Israel doesn't seek to radically change the region. Israel wants to be left alone in its part of the region, and Saudi Arabia was also a key part of America's foreign policy in the region, along with Israel, right? So American foreign policy was built on its relationship with Saudi Arabia, with Israel, for a time with Turkey, with Egypt, and these countries that were under American influence of stability in the region. Uh, Saudi Arabia has changed somewhat over the years in realizing uh, that its support for for extreme, extremist Islam, Sunni Islam, has led to uh, terrorism, 9-11, Al-Qaeda, right? These are things that spread from Saudi Arabian Wahhabi extremist uh, Islam. Um, and it's now fighting against those uh, extremist elements in the region. Iran, right, we talked about Shia and Sunni. Iran is the major Shia power in the region. And they are both competing for who is the most influential and dominant country in the region. Even if we take Islam out of the question, these two countries are going to be fighting for who's the big dog in the region. Right. And spreading their form of Islam and their leadership over as many countries as possible. When a country has influence over another country, it can dictate to that country how to act, what policies to enact, to serve its own interests. Right? Big countries in general have this kind of thinking. So you have one major Sunni power who's taken leadership of the Sunni world, and one major Shia power who's taken control of the Shia world. Saudi Arabia has realized that Israel is no threat to it, and that it's aligned ideologically against many of the radical elements in the region. Whereas in Iran's thinking, ever since the 79 revolution, it needs to, this is the, the core being of its country, it needs to expel uh, decadent and, and corrupt Western influences from the region, of which it sees Israel as a part of it. Okay? It fights Saudi Arabia. Right? There's a Cold War. I can mention it later. There's a Cold War right now between Saudi Arabia and Iran. That's because they're vying for regional power and they're competing forms of Islam. Iran fights Israel because it sees it as an outpost of the West, which it wants to expel from the region. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Okay. All right. Now, what we can do, um, I'll leave it at this, and I can go into any specific area you want. Um, you know, before that, I want to mention just a couple things, and then we can go into questions. I think we're pretty good on the Palestinians. Uh, we can talk about Iran if you like. I want to mention a couple things. The Iranian threat and the Iranian nuclear deal. <coughs> so... Iran, like I said, it's the Shiite power, certainly in the world, and it strives to be the dominant power in the region. <coughs> it's radically <coughs> anti-West in its very being, right? This is part of the 79 revolution of, of expelling the Western influences that are corrupting Islam, that are corrupting the region, that are corrupting the country. And America and anything America related, and Israel, is an ex they see Israel as an extension of America, as part of that. Once it's, it had a war, a very brutal war against Iraq in the 80s, once that war was over, Iran turned back to its regional strategy. 
uh, of, of gaining influence throughout the region. And that involved developing a nuclear program, right? Every country, anyone who's cool has got to have a nuclear program. Um, and supporting radicals anywhere it can. It didn't turn to a conventional military strategy, right? I said earlier, Iran did not have a massive conventional army. It did prior to 1979, it was mostly American. And they did little to build that up. So there, the Iranian army today can defend itself if it's attacked, but it doesn't have the power to project forces. Right? If, we, if we want to geek you out a little bit on, uh, on what it means to attack another country with an army, you need about, anyone play Risk? Yes, play risk. Yeah, yeah. You need a three to one ratio, right? The Risk ratio is, is actually pretty true for, for conventional military ratio. You need a three to one ratio, uh, attacker defender, in order to have a chance at invading another country. Which means you need to pour a lot of money into building a conventional military. You have to constantly update it, you have to constantly train it. Um, it takes a lot of money, a lot of time. And they've decided the best way that they can project their power is through supporting radical elements. When we talked about the nuclear program, what we were talking about was a secret program actually that started back under the Shah. Okay? And it was put on pause. The Shah was the leader pre uh, Khomeini, pre Khomeini, I should say. And uh, they brought it back secretly. It was revealed in uh, 2003 by Iranian dissidents. Um, and since then, the international community has tried to put a halt to this nuclear program. The circles and the little yellow blurbs are the major installations. I won't bore you with what each one of them is. Uh, but over the years, they've been exposed to the international community and to the intelligence communities, the parts of the program. And what basically happened uh, <coughs> was that this past year was a red line for international action against the nuclear program. Okay? Again, to geek you out a little bit on, on nuclear uh, uh, weapon making here, you need, okay, so uranium you take from the ground. Stop me if you guys know this. It's in a mineral form, and you have to continuously purify it by spinning it around in a centrifuge. It's like a tube about yay big that spins around really fast until you <coughs> separate the non-uranium from the pure uranium. Three and a half percent enriched uranium means you took it and you purified it until it was three and a half percent uranium is what you need for like a nuclear power plant. Twenty percent is what you need for, say, medical research. And 90% is what you need for a weapon. So Iran had about 7,000 kilos of 3.5% enriched uranium, according to most intelligence estimates. It had another 200 kilos of 20% enriched uranium. And in order to make a weapon, you need 225 kilos of 20% in order to get enough 90% enriched uranium. So they're really close, right? The estimates, two months, give or take, from a nuclear weapon. This was why diplomacy was so crucial when it was. Um, about 20,000 of these centrifuges, let's say half of them actually worked. In addition to a nuclear weapon and getting enough enriched material, you need what to deliver a nuclear weapon? Warhead. Missile. You need a warhead, good, that's that little cartoon there on the left. And you need a missile, which Iran already has plenty of missiles. It's developed over the years in North Korea. So the threat was there and it was really close. And by all means, something needs to be done about it. Beyond the nuclear program, even if Iran didn't have a nuclear program, uh, Iran still spreads its influence to regional groups. And this is just as big a threat to us. So it supports, has proxies in Syria. Assad was essentially an Iranian puppet. <coughs> Hezbollah, which is stronger than the actual Lebanese state. For a while, it supported Hamas. Right now, they're actually not on speaking terms, but it still tries to support Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Iraq is basically today an Iranian puppet. Yemen, the Houthis who took over, are backed by Iran. Bahrain, which is actually largely Shia to some extent. <coughs> and it supports these elements still today through four major uh, ways by spreading its version of Islam, its radical version of Islam, by arms supplies, 
by training in Iran, right? Advanced guerrilla and advanced terror techniques, and cash. I don't know if you can see that pile of money. So even without a nuclear program, even without any missiles, Iran is still a massive threat to us, and also to the Saudis, and also to anywhere that the U.S. has influence in the region. This is just, you can see what an arms shipment looks like when it's caught. Right there. And for a while, Iran was trying to send arms shipments on boats, uh, cargo ships, uh, hiding them in sacks of flour. Uh, one time they found lentils. Right? They put sacks of lentils over the, the weapons to try to hide them uh, and avoid uh, you know, customs and detection and things like that. So uh, for all, you can see the map there. So what they were doing for a while is sending them around um, into the Indian Ocean and then past Yemen and to Sudan. And then from Sudan, smugglers would take them on uh, truck caravans into Sinai and then put them in the tunnels into Gaza, which is how they got weapons into Gaza for a long time. They're still doing this to an extent. Uh, it's less successful for them today. And they also try to send ships directly to Hezbollah or to Syria. Luckily, we were able to intercept a lot of these, um, which is why, if you see that direct line between Tehran and Damascus, uh, they switched to putting the arms on airplanes, uh, civilian airplanes, Iran Air and other Iranian airlines. Uh, you got the passengers sitting on top and weapons in the luggage compartment, and they would then smuggle them off in Damascus airport with the help of the regime, which was helping them in this plan. Um, and of course, anywhere where Iran can freely send a ship, then it has no problem trying to hide its arms shipments although these are illegal according to the United Nations Security Council resolutions. For a while, there was a major international effort, I was a part of it, against Iran, diplomatically, with sanctions, right, to try to limit Iran's uh, outreach to the world, uh, <coughs> secret missions, assassinations, viruses, I won't say who did them, uh, and the threat of military force, okay? This led to the nuclear agreement. There's a lot of details there, we won't get into it. All I'm gonna say about the nuclear agreement, and I'd be happy to hear what your thoughts are on this, is that it delayed, if it's implemented, aggressively, it will delay Iran's capability to achieve a nuclear weapon by 10 to 15 years, okay? That's what it does. In that time, the United States and the international community are going to have to do uh, a lot of thinking and a lot of activity to try to make sure that after that time, Iran doesn't achieve its nuclear weapon. Um, the how deal, how would they do that? Like what? What type of stuff would they be able to do to... To do it? Yeah. So first, like I said, it needs to be implemented. Um, part of the deal was to have it's, uh, a really intrusive inspection regime in all of Iran's known nuclear facilities. Okay. Uh, one of the big criticisms against the American negotiators in the deal was that Iran was able to get out of having <coughs> to divulge what's happening at uh, non-unknown facilities that is suspected of nuclear activity, right? So the major nuclear sites, there are cameras there, there are inspectors there, that's fine. And it's going to be pretty hard to cheat. But let's say Iran decides to go to another unknown underground facility, which is what they've been doing for the past 20 years. In order to be able to inspect there, the international mechanism is gonna have to submit a proposal and wait, I think it's 21 days, don't catch me on the exact numbers, or 24 days. Iran has to authorize that it's allowed to bring in inspectors there. And at that time, it could theoretically clean up what was happening, hide the traces of nuclear involvement, make up a cover story, the volumes are fantastic at this. So, even if it's implemented aggressively, you still have issues there. This is where intelligence work comes in. Certainly American, Israeli, European intelligence is not going to sit quietly by and let Iran try to do whatever it wants. <coughs> um, and if you have a strong enough case with your intelligence organizations, then you can confront the United Nations, you can confront the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is in charge of the inspections, 
you can confront the Iranians directly. Um, and all that is just on the nuclear issue, right? So what do you do in the meantime against Iran's regional activism and support for terrorism? What do you do in the meantime to support uh, moderates in Iran? That's a really relative term. Uh, because the whole gamble of those who negotiated the deal was that in 15 years' time, Iran would hopefully would be a lot more moderate and less of a threat to the region, right? It wouldn't want nuclear weapons. Um, what country doesn't want nuclear weapons? Most countries don't want nuclear weapons. It's a huge hassle. And it draws a threat, sometimes more than it allays it. Yeah? Uh, what negotiating leverage did Iran have? What negotiated, right, okay. So the negotiating leverage, like I pointed out here, that the West had, or that the, the uh, international community led by the United States had, was a massive, massive sanctions campaign that was really hurting Iran's economy, okay? The threat of military strike, which the last two years Obama took off the table, but Israel never took off the table. Um, and that was enough pressure to get Iran to the table. What did Iran have? So I never bought it. A lot of people never bought it, but Iran really, first of all, tried to sell that if, if it was ever attacked, it could disrupt oil flow through the Persian Gulf, okay? I don't remember the exact number, but something like a quarter of the world's oil flows through the Persian Gulf, right? Go back to a map. Okay, so you see where it says Bandar Abbas, right there? Yeah, Not yeah, really, yeah. but I know it is. I mean, I, I know it's on the other very north. Right. Right. It's called the Straits of Hormuz, right there. Um, and this is a key choke point, right there, just yeah. a couple miles wide. On the one side is Iran, on the other side is, I want to say, Oman or Qatar. And um, oh, sorry, that's the UAE. Uh, the UAE. And should Iran want for a good week? two weeks, it can totally disrupt the flow of oil, most of the world's oil, through that. So that was a physical threat that Iran always held over the world's head. But... That you felt wasn't true? I felt it was more bluster than an actual threat. I, th I think American naval capabilities there could have taken out Iran much faster uh, than Iran was threatening. But more importantly, Iran could have could have kicked out um, the few international inspectors that were in Iran. It could have ended the negotiations, and it could have rushed to a nuclear weapon. This was this this was its big threat. That's not that's not really leverage. It is leverage because if it rushes to a nuclear weapon and is able to achieve it before the world can gather its coalition and gather troops and strike Iran, right? then it has a nuclear weapon. And once a country has a nuclear weapon, you don't attack it so quickly, okay? Because an Iran with even one nuclear weapon can say, if you attack us, we're dropping this thing on Israel, or Saudi Arabia. So if they could get a nuclear weapon tomorrow before we have a chance to figure out what right. we're gonna do, that's a And for us. the current American administration, and certainly the Europeans, right, after the failure of the Iraq war, uh, you can debate whether going into Iraq was a good idea or not, in 2003, whether it, was a good, whether it was a good idea or not, it was done horribly wrong. And part of how Obama came into power was promising a radically different foreign policy, uh, and anything but Bush foreign policy. And war was the last thing uh, that this current administ American administration wants, right? And Iran knew it. So it <coughs> threatened to walk away from talks. And as long as it's not engaged in a negotiation process, it can keep enriching uranium. What are you going to do about it? You're going to attack it? Clearly, nobody wanted to attack Iran. And America was holding back Israel from attacking Iran. Um, if America wasn't holding back, would they? That's a really tough question. Um, I'll answer from what I know from press reports that it's not really clear, because it's a huge risk. You start a regional war if you attack Iran. That said, the supposed Israeli strikes on Syria didn't start a war, and everyone purposely ignored it because Syria really didn't want to get into a war with Israel. So, you can guess that. Yeah. If there were to be no deal, would, would that be better than this deal? I don't think so. 
Um, and, and I published as much uh, as they were in the closing stages of the debate. Um, and I'll give you guys a link to, to read this if you want later, but the gist of it is this deal is better than no deal, but a much better deal could have been negotiated, right? I think American and international leverage on Iran was much stronger than the negotiators allowed themselves to play. I think they got hustled, I'm going to say it in a very colloquial way, by Iranian negotiating tactics, right? If you've ever been to a Middle Eastern market and the, you know, the seller says, this is your last chance at the discount, otherwise I'm walking away. You know, in a very simplistic way, that's kind of what happened, I think. Is it possible they're just buying time? Uh, it's always possible. But why do they need to buy time? They get all the sanctions lifted from them, and it really was hurting their economy. As long as they push back for 10 or 15 years from where they already were. Okay? So if they want to sneak to a nuclear weapon, it's very dangerous. They can do it. But if they get caught, they know they risk war, and they know they can't handle a war with the West. They don't, it's not really clear they want a nuclear weapon. They want the prestige of a nuclear weapon. They want the possibility of a nuclear weapon because it lets them, uh, um, it lets them express their power over the rest of the region, right? The country with the nuclear weapon is clearly the most powerful country in the region. Nobody's gonna attack it. People are gonna be very careful with it. And so you don't need even the nuclear weapon. You can be a week or a month away from nuclear weapon in order to have that same effect. So if they get a nuclear weapon, it doesn't mean they're going to use it? Most likely not. Most experts don't think Iran would actually use a nuclear weapon. A lot of people try to claim that Iran is, is messianic and suicidal and that they're <coughs> most security experts, including myself, are very much against that position. Uh, they think Iran is doing it for the confidence and so uh, to be able to deter anybody from deciding to attack Iran. Because like I said, once a country has a nuclear weapon, you don't attack it. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so is the only goal of American Israel to prevent the regime in Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon, or would they prefer to eliminate the regime in totality? Okay, so that's a good question. Um, one of the major goals of Israel and America and much of the West is that the regime be a lot less radical. You don't necessarily need a new regime, just as long as the, the regime becomes significantly less radical. Looks like the current regime is, is so radical and so also deeply entrenched. This isn't something that can be overthrown, right? This is a very strong, deeply entrenched regime with all sorts of elites across Iranian society. Uh, that even if most of the people don't like the regime, it's too strong to be overthrown easily. Um, the thinking was that by conducting this deal, you also open up Iran to the West, to greater contact with the West. Uh, to a better standard of living, and that the people will generally, uh, gradually demand reforms from the regime, and that even if it doesn't moderate on its own, it'll be pressured to moderate because it sees that's what the people want, right? While it's a dictatorship, it's, uh, even dictatorships have to be very clever in not upsetting their own people too much, because you saw what happened in other parts of the world, right, like, like Egypt or like Syria, um, and that leads to revolutions, or leads to, to overthrows. Um, the short term was make sure they don't get a nuclear weapon. The long term is, is stop them from carrying out their regional policy. And yeah, the, the, you know, the, uh, the really long term would be to change the nature of the regime so it's not a threatening regime. Yeah? If, uh, if a nuclear weapon is fired in missile form, um, and you know, it's in the air. Is there any defense that can be done against it? Good question. Yes. Okay. Uh, I don't know if the Iron Dome would... Uh... Well, so I'll talk about that. Over the years, <clears throat> and I mean about 20 years, Israel has worked together with the United States to develop a ballistic missile defense architecture. Okay? So you can see the picture. Mean? Sorry? What does that mean exactly? All right. So... I'll take a step back and I'll talk about right, the nature of warfare and the nature right, the nature of warfare is that you develop a weapon and your enemy develops a counter weapon or a defense. Okay? Mm -hmm. When you talk about an arrow, 
shield, okay, and then a vigor, and then a catapult, and a sword, and, right, and a vigor kind of gun, back and forth throughout history, if you look at the history of warfare, and the history of the development of weapons. Realizing that they can't beat Israel or the West conventionally, a lot of, uh, not just Israel's enemies, but, but also the North Koreans, uh, the Russians to a certain extent, back when they were the Soviet Union, developed a strategy based on firing missiles and rockets, because there was no defense for it. Okay? Attack me all you want, I'm going to fire rockets at you, there's nothing you can do. Um, Iran did this, Iran helped <coughs> Syria, Iran helped Hezbollah, and Iran helped Hamas follow this line of strategy. And the result was, is that our enemies literally all around us had massive amounts of rockets and missiles, by the way, the difference is that a rocket is not guided, a missile is guided. Okay. Um, that Israel could do nothing about. Realizing that this was one of the main threats that we didn't have an answer to, our R&D people years ago started developing a missile defense system. Now, uh, I was much younger when this happened, but in the uh, Gulf War of 1991, right, when Saddam Hussein fired 41, I want to say, missiles at Israel, there was not yet this kind of missile defense system. The Americans came in, put a Patriot anti-aircraft system, and tried and failed to shoot down these missiles in the air. Since then, this has been greatly improved, to the point where you have these systems that, with a radar, can detect where the missile is, and then you have a very smart missile that is shot up right at the point of, at the high point of the trajectory of the missile, and shoots in midair. And then the missile itself is destroyed. Debris does land on the ground. It can injure whoever is directly under it. But that's far less damage than what a missile is. Israel right now is a world leader in this. A lot of the cooperation and the funding comes from the United States. And the United States is also developing its own systems. So what we have now, what we have now is a, it's going to be a four-tiered system, right? Four tiers, four levels of, of uh, interception. So Iron Dome, which we saw in 2014 and we saw in 2012 before that, is the shortest range. And these are meant for short-range projectiles coming from Hamas, coming from <coughs> Lebanon close to Israel. And these are, um, they, they all work on the same concept, right? You have a radar, a very advanced radar. It detects where the missile's going. And then an interceptor missile comes up and meets it. The next level, the next level of altitude, is something that just now is coming online and is becoming operational. It's called the David Sling. Okay, this is David Sling is the name of it. And this is the same concept, just for a higher altitude. We already have Arrow 2, which can meet long-range missiles, like from Iran or from deeper into Syria, when Syria was a threat. And within the next couple of years, we hope to have the Arrow 3, which will be more advanced and a higher altitude of missile. So theoretically, were a missile to be fired from Iran into Israel, we could have two, possibly three, chances to intercept it at different altitudes. If you shoot it out of the air, will there still be radiation issues? Uh, good question. I th think they're more limited, but I don't exactly know how to answer that. Yeah. I think, you know, like her, like the way a nuclear missile is uh, long as like it has to go like out of that, like out the atmosphere and come in. Right. So the hour three would go, would also be able to go that high. Uh, you're talking about ICBMs, intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missiles. Those are the longest range, yeah. and those uh, come out of the atmosphere and come back in. Uh, no, I don't believe that these come out of the atmosphere. Um, I, I don't know the exact technical details of where it meets it, but it also defines a point so that it lands over an unpopulated area far away from Israel, probably over the Jordanian desert or the Iraqi desert where it would meet these. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Um, why would the technology be different for longer range? Why wouldn't it just work the same way? They could just identify where it is and shoot at it. Uh, good question. I don't know. I'm not an engineer. Okay. But I know there is a difference because we've had different timelines of rolling these out. I mean, generally, the technology is the same overall, which is why we're able to roll out three, four More precision. of these type of systems. 
Uh, by the way, they're interconnected. They work together. And during uh, wartime, and I had the opportunity to, uh, to do this in, in, in massive training, uh, um, uh, training exercises with the American Army, the American Army brings here their own systems, and then we link up on a ship. And we link up with the American systems, and then we have even more chances, even more tiers, and even more uh, uh, interceptor missiles to try to, to uh, defend against Syrian or Iranian missiles, should they be fired. Yeah. In the Can any of these work on uh, rockets? Or? Right. So the shorter tier ones, like, like uh, Iron Dome or David Sling, work on rockets. Again, the only difference with the rocket is that it's not guided. Right, so. so as far as the system goes, it doesn't matter. Once a rocket or a missile is fired, its trajectory is very clear. And this is the one of the two key elements of the system is that it knows how to detect what that trajectory will be. Now, as far as Israel goes, they're uh, predetermined around certain defense areas. Right? We have batteries. A battery is a radar and a uh, silo of missiles that are shot up. And it's like, let's say, we'll put one around Modi'in and say we're defending Modi'in. So if one catches a missile that's coming near Modi'in but is going to fall a kilometer or half a kilometer outside of Modi'in in a farm, it's not going to intercept it. Okay? So you can tell it which altitude and which geographic area to, to intercept. Yeah. Is uh, Iran's nuclear program, is it to be able to create the capability to create weapons quickly, like multiple weapons, or are they, or are they aiming towards one missile and then potentially another one in the future? Right. Like so the numbers you gave. So the way, the way uh, first of all, in nuclear programs you have a plutonium track and a uranium track. And the plutonium track you use one large core reactor, and the uranium track you use a lot of centrifuges. Um, Iran tried to develop both. It had a, uh, a plutonium reactor in Iraq, okay? Um, but that's much easier to control. It's much easier, <laughs> right, not Iraq, Iraq. And much easier to control, much easier to monitor. And as part of the deal, the core of that nuclear reactor was filled with cement. The centrifuge track, which has been more their choice, is much easier to hide. Because you can put, you know, you pick a mountainside here and a mountainside there. And you put these secret underground facilities, and you can put a thousand centrifuges here, a couple thousand there, a couple thousand there. By the way, as the centrifuges become more advanced generationally, okay, you need fewer centrifuges to produce the same amount of material. So I think the ratio is, is somewhere around one to eight, right? A second generation centrifuge is eight times as powerful as a first generation centrifuge. Uh, the more centrifuges you have, and the more advanced they are, the more enriched material you can create for weapons. And like I said, missiles are not a problem. They have enough missiles. Um, so part of the issue, uh, and, and during this agreement, they're limited to how many centrifuges they can have running. And the centrifuges they're allowed to have running are under inspection. But they are allowed to conduct limited advanced research on centrifuges. And once the 15 years is up, there's no limits on how many centrifuges they can have. So once the 15 years are up, they can have, they can go back to having 20, 30, 40,000 centrifuges, which means they can stockpile as much as they want. And then they're only subject to the international limitations that every other country in the world that signed the NPT, that's the nuclear agreement that says I won't build a nuclear weapon, they're limited to that same agreement, which is pretty easy to cheat if you wanted to cheat. Yeah. Um, two questions. One of uh, do, do they have any plan of making another deal after the 15 years, or they're just going to let Aaron do? So p part of the thinking, and, and I've written this, and I, I've seen others have written this, is that these 15 years should be used to, uh, you don't just let them finish and, and expire, but they should be used to negotiate another deal, uh, redevelop the pressure on Iran, and as long as Iran is still a radical country in 15 years, which everyone expects it to be, then there should be something else in place. Um, I don't know what the internal you know, thinking inside the US government is right now, but I've, I've, I've suggested this, and a lot of people have suggested that this should be the kind of thinking. And how, what's the well, time it takes to make a uh, kilo of 20% uranium? Uh, if you have enough centrifuges, you can churn out you can turn them out really fast. 
uh, a week, two weeks, you know, a month. You can, depending on how many centrifuges you have. Uh, if you have everything in place and you just haven't made the decision to make the weapon, it's pretty fast. That's why, until a couple months ago, Iran was about two months away from developing, from having enough uranium. That's all they needed. Two months. If everyone left them alone to continue enriching, they would have had enough to finish it off. Which presidential, American presidential candidate do you think would be the most beneficial to Israel? And which police? That's a tough call. I actually had this debate with my colleagues earlier. Uh, it's really hard to say. It's really hard to say because a lot of the candidates have no foreign policy experience. Uh, Israel has not been the subject of debate in the, uh, in the debate so far, in the elections. Um, like you have on the Republican side a lot of people talking tough about staying loyal to traditional allies, including Israel. On the Democratic side, no one's discussed it. I can imagine because of Sanders' worldview, it would not be especially good for Israel. Uh, Clinton is the closest thing we have to a known commodity on foreign policy, and she's always been fairly good for Israel. Um, as far as foreign policy, Rubio and Cruz have, have professed their support for Israel. I guess all the Republicans have. Um, but none of them have any actual foreign policy experience, uh, so it's hard to say. Trump also professed his uh, love for Israel? Sure. Um, at the same time he says anti-Semitic remarks, he also <laughs> professes his support for Israel. Um, but that's more of something that the Republicans have to do in the current American political map, rather <coughs> than shows their true feelings. It's safe to guess it's safe to guess that a Republican, any Republican would be better for Israel than any Democrat. But you know that's something that you won't really know until until you get there. Yeah. Uh, I want to mention one more thing after we talked about Iran. That's the tunnels. All right. We talked about the U.S.'s changing role in the world. This is something that's hugely important, and kind of the question led into this. It's not clear where it's going to go, by the way. But what happened was, is after the Iraq fiasco, right, what we call the uh, hubris of the Bush administration, thinking they could fix the world's problems through the use of military force and a lot of money and crafty diplomacy, after that vision failed, there was a massive recoil in the <coughs> Obama administration to get out of the Middle East, to get out of a leadership role in the world, an America that since World War II had seen itself as the leader of the free world and the policeman of the free world, all of a sudden you have a president that says, we're not the policeman of the free world. Every country in its region needs to step up. Even questions of whether the U.S. is an exceptional power, right? If the U.S. has that right to agree with it or not. This was a question. Has that right to tell other countries what to do to lead other countries what to do, and to use military force when other countries don't follow its vision. So this is something that was clearly uh, part of the Bush administration and clearly not part of the Obama administration. Uh, since almost day one, since his speech in Cairo, President Obama has made it a point to uh, be on better terms with uh, Iran and with most of, most of the Middle East. Part of that strategy was to distance himself from Israel. Okay, at least publicly, um, and to show as much restraint as possible abroad. Let's not get into any foreign policy wars that are not really crucial for American <coughs> national security. Uh, one of the big criticisms about this current administration is that they didn't get involved in Syria, right? And we see the effects of that now, and we see that Russia did get involved because America didn't get involved. And Nobody knows where this is going to go in the next presidency. A lot of the Republican candidates are talking tough about going back to a Bush-style, neoconservative, activist foreign policy. On the Democratic side, it's pretty clear that they want to limit their involvement, uh, certainly from a military perspective in foreign policy. Um, and what that's led to is a realignment of things in the region. And like I said, it's changed our relationship with America. It's changed. Uh, the Turks and Saudis, traditional American allies, 
And it's not clear where America's relationship with Iran is going. There's been a lot of criticism, but I don't want to say a whole lot because it's just not clear. I don't even think from an American perspective where that relationship is going. The bottom line on this one is that the relationship between the US and the world, and specifically the US and the Middle East, has changed very fundamentally and it's affected absolutely everything in the region. Yeah. Which, uh, uh, I guess, which America would you think is best for the Middle East? Um, to be a leader of the world or taking the back seat? I personally think I've written as much that America should be in the leadership role. Um, in, in the, the world needs America in the leadership role. And we've seen what happens with resurgent powers like Iran, like Russia, uh, when America vacates that leadership role. Even with, no, even with military? Yes, that okay. said, it needs to be exercised very cautiously, realizing there are limits to what <coughs> military power can do. Okay, and, and I think the lesson from Iraq should not be what the Obama administration said was we shouldn't get involved in, in, in foreign wars that are not ours, or try to overthrow countries and rebuild them, unless it's absolutely vital for American uh, interests. Rather, things need to be done in a much smarter way, much more cautiously, a lot more planning, like I said, by all accounts, the Iraq war was handled badly. Uh, there was an argument whether it was smart to go in in the first place or not. I don't think it was so smart to go into Iraq, personally. But that doesn't say that something like Syria, uh, which now we're seeing the effects of it a few years later, has turned into an absolute fiasco by international standards. So you see Obama took, Obama's administration basically took the exact opposite of extreme, but that was too much, there should right. be a the middle ground right. hasn't really been found yet. It, it needs to constantly be found yeah. in, every, in every scenario, but right, that's, that's basically what happened. Yeah. Okay. Two fairly unrelated questions. Um, what kind of impact does cyber warfare have in the, um, in the scene? Good question. So, much like rockets and missiles, um, it's I don't want to say it's a weapon of the week, but it's a weapon that you don't need massive uh, conventional military capabilities in order to use into you do it from your bedroom. bedroom. You do it for your bedroom. A, 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 a country that doesn't have a large army can build a cyber capability. And because the world is becoming more and more online and digitized, uh, cyber weapons can have more and more of an influence. There is the added issue, well, there's two more added issues. One, it's not always clear where the cyber tech came from, okay? So if <coughs> Israel attacks, I don't know, Syria, right? With a warplane, it's pretty easy to see who did that attack, and then Syria can say, am I retaliating against Israel or not? Or vice versa, right? If Saudi Arabia bombs Iran, the Iranians can say, okay, Saudi Arabia attacked us, are we going to react? Are we not going to? Uh, cyber weapons can be employed even by a country through a proxy very easily. Uh, you can hide who did it. And it leaves a, a level of deniability um, where a country doesn't know who attacked it, maybe. And it can certainly use that level of deniability um, to decide not to attack, to decide to play dumb and look the other way and say this is not worth a physical war. And secondly, um, it's not a physical attack. So while it can do real damage, this is something that the world hasn't quite gotten used to yet, right? If a, a plane or a missile or a tank attacks you, it destroys the building. People are physically killed. It has a different psychological effect on a government and a society than if you know your computer loses all its memory. That said, we saw that a certain cyber attack on Iran's nuclear infrastructure a few years ago reportedly managed to put that nuclear program off track for a good few months, set it back for a good few months with the cyber attack. Um, right now, certainly the major powers in the world are developing cyber capabilities, and the non-major powers in the world are also. Iran has a pretty advanced cyber capability. Uh, Palestinian hackers have a certain cyber capability. Uh, the Chinese have a really advanced cyber capability. And like I said, certainly Israel and certainly the Americans. Israel, by the way, is considered and could be 
a cyber superpower. Even though we're a small country globally, we could be a cyber, a cyber warfare superpower. Um, it levels the playing field to a certain extent, because like I said, you don't need a whole fleet of, of uh, fighter planes or, or warships or tanks, um, and it levels the playing field. It allows a level of deniability, um, both for the attacker and for the attacked, and it hasn't been around long enough for it to, um, for the repercussions of what a cyber war would look like to be really thought out. Okay, there's a lot of conferences going on right now and a lot of uh, academics and a lot of uh, people dealing with military law and warfare law trying to figure out where this stands, right? If a, if a country is attacked with a cyber weapon, is that the same thing as being attacked with a regular weapon? Is it different? How do we respond? What does international law say on this? Um, it's having an effect. Everyone's talking about it. Everyone's rushing to get there and develop their capabilities. It's being used cautiously. Um, but it's, uh, we're not even seeing close to the full potential of it. Same, same question. Um, a friend of mine, programmer, recently joined the Army. So he started out in Modin um, Intelligence, and then he, I think he was turned away because due to the fact that he is a lone soldier from America, he wasn't given the proper credentials, the proper um, clearance. clearance. So I don't know exactly what, what your story is, but how would, how would someone from America um, reach a higher position in intelligence or even any other area when we're not really trusted as much? Right, it's a good question. So my story is a touch different because my parents, my mom's Israeli born and my dad actually made Aliyah way back when and then I lived here for the first few years of my life. Yeah. So my story is a little different because I had, I had Israeli citizenship from age one and both my parents served in the army here and, and it was much easier for me to get security clearance even though I grew up in the States. For the average American, I saw this a lot of times, not just American, any, any uh, Ole coming who wants to serve in the army and get security clearance, I'll be perfectly honest with you, it's not easy. Um, not because you can't be trusted because you're foreign, but because you haven't been in the country for long enough. So what I have seen, and this is you know, something um, that can be done, is to be in the country for a few years before you join the army. Right, because the people doing the background checks need to be able to conduct the proper investigation into you, um, talk to enough people that know you, have enough of a record on you to look back and say, is this person doing anything that should worry us? By the way, they're, they're not worried that the person's a spy. It's more the question of, are they cautious? Where do they travel? Who do they talk to? Maybe he's got, I don't know, Arab friends back in Michigan or Florida or wherever that they regularly talk to and they might spill the beans. And these are all kinds of, you know, or did this person go on vacation in South America and they can be kidnapped easily, right? These are, can their family be pressured were it to be found out? These are various questions. And the longer you're in Israel, um, the more chance you have of getting clearance. The more control Israel has over the variables. What's that? The more control Israel has over the variables. Right. And the more background they have to look at. Um, that said, also anyone looking to do something more meaningful in the army, not saying that certain jobs are not meaningful, but you know, getting to the really hardcore stuff in the army, you need a really high level of Hebrew for most of these jobs. And the longer you're in the country, the longer you're gonna have that higher level of Hebrew. So what I've seen people do is make Aliyah and then go and push off the army, maybe do a degree stay here for a couple of years, build up their time in Israel, build up their Hebrew, build up their connections, and then come back to the army uh, after a few years have passed. And I've, I've seen that be a little more successful than just you know, getting off the airplane and joining the army right away. Yeah? Mm -hmm. All right. um, so um, I've been considering whether or not I want to join the Israeli army. And, um, and I've been recreationally learning programming, and that's what I want to do with my mm -hmm. life. So, I know I have friends who are programmers in the army, and if I knew that I would be able to do that uh, in the army, it would, it would significantly increase the chances of my doing it. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know exactly how the system works. I think you said you might talk about it a little bit. Sure. Um, I don't know. I, I know you have some preference, but at the end, they put you wherever they want. Are you able to say, like, you know, programming or nothing? That doesn't really, I don't know. Um, to an extent, it also depends when you make all the yeah? So there's different, uh, the older you are, the less you're expected to do. Um, 
I, I forget the exact age limitation <coughs> to find that information, but over a certain age, you just do a couple months uh, to prepare you for, for reserve duty for Miluim, and then it's usually pretty simple tasks um, and, and not the hard force, certainly nothing intelligence or computer programming wise. Um, you got to think the more that the army is going to invest in your training, the longer they're going to want to keep you. Uh, that said, you can always volunteer for longer stays, which is what I did. I was 24 when I joined the army and I volunteered for a six year program. Um, and it ended up becoming eight years, so I ended up staying eight years total in the army. Um, having computer background helps, certainly, but what they most want to see is um, they, they do psychometric tests, so to test your, your intelligence and your kind of intelligence and uh, you know, like I said, if you have the computer background and the program background, you can ask and they can lead you towards certain things, assuming you can get the security clearance. Um, you can say, I want a program or nothing, and then they might put you in something for just a short period of time and let you go. Uh, again, depending on how old you are. So if you're coming in when you're 20, 21, 22, you have more ability to say that. But then at those ages, they also are less interested in you. I don't know if that answers your question. Mm -hmm. uh, How is Israel's relationship with Turkey? Turkey, good question. That's the next slide, actually. Not the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> Almost the next slide. So, I'll say it very briefly about Turkey. For years, Israel and Turkey were very close allies, uh, part of the American group of uh, sphere of influence in the region. We had uh, military cooperation with them, great economic cooperation with them. Because we were the non-Islamist, uh, Western-aligned, non-Arab countries in the, in the region. In the early 2000s, and I should say maybe frustrated by not being admitted to the European Union, which Turkey had tried to do for a number of years, uh, a Islamist party came to power, the AKP, right, the Justice and Development Party. Um, came to power and over the next decade had a policy of what I like to call turning eastward. So Turkey was very much a westward facing country for a long time, part of NATO, key ally of the United States in the Cold War and after. Turkey realized that it might have a better chance of success and influence if it reestablished itself as the the dominant Islamic power, certainly in the Middle East, right? If you remember for centuries, Turkey was the Ottoman Empire, right? It was one of the major empires in the world. And it's not exactly clear uh, that gentleman in the picture is uh, Erdogan, um, the current Turkish president, before that he was the prime minister, uh, Tayyip Erdogan. It's not exactly clear how much of his anti-Israel rhetoric was real or how much he was just saying it to get the Arabs on board and to view him as the leader. But there was a lot of anti-Israel rhetoric, support for Hamas, um, and the height of those tensions was in 2010 when they sent the Marmara, right, uh, a, a protest vote to protest the Israeli uh, blockade on Gaza. And uh, we stopped it, and there, the people on board were not peaceful protesters. They had knives, they had bats, and they tried to attack the soldiers. Our soldiers killed eight of their protesters. And that was the greatest height of tensions between Turkey and Israel. Um, military cooperation stopped. Uh, diplomatic contact was cut off. The ambassadors were recalled. Now, for the first time, and over the past few months, we've seen signs of what's, what's called in diplomatic jargon, rapprochement, right? So Turkey's all of a sudden hinting they could be friends with Israel again. Let's return diplomatic representation. Uh, I should say Israel had to agree to apologize for the Marmara incident, uh, compensate the families, um, and there's discussion over the blockade of Gaza. But I think Turkey did this because they feel isolated in the region. They all of a sudden had tensions with Russia because Russia got involved in Syria, and Turkey's involved in Syria on opposite sides. And um, Turkey felt all of a sudden uh, it lost a lot of confidence and it felt isolated in the region. And so it looked to uh, 
go back to normalizing relations with Israel. By the way, partly to gain favor again in the West. What, what caused it to move away from the West in the first place, though? Uh, like I said, probably frustration with the European Union, which it wanted to gain access to, and it cut, it was constantly denied access to oh, the European Union. Oh, there's disconnect in the first place because it was denied, but I'm saying. What caused this disconnect? What caused the disconnect from the European Union? I mean, there was a disconnect because that is a problem they had with the West, so it's right. not like they started going to the West End because there was already a problem. Right. So as it saw that it could not necessarily be part of the West, and as it, the economy was developing very rapidly, and it saw a an opportunity to once again become the dominant power in the region, or at least vie for being the dominant power in the region, uh, to return to its traditional sphere of influence, meaning the Middle East and Central Asia. Um, that's why it started to do that. And, and like I said, an Islamist party, for the first time, came to power in Turkey. Up to this point, Turkey was ruled by very secular, very Western-leaning elites, right, from Ataturk, who founded the, the Turkish Republic after World War I. And, and that ruling elite was, for the first time, replaced by an Islamist elite. Uh, Turkey, <coughs> while secular, is still 80 million Muslims. Um, and they played off of uh, certain frustrations. They played uh, the Islamic card. Uh, while Islam was actually um, uh, repressed. <coughs> Public expressions of Islam were, impre were repressed for a long time in Turkey. Women couldn't wear hijab, uh, issues of public prayer, uh, alcohol was everywhere, and this government slowly but surely began making Turkey more Muslim. Uh, not in a radical sense necessarily, but more Muslim, reclaiming its Muslim repression. Generally, when you look at countries that try to force a certain identity on people, there's a backlash. And, and secularism and Westernism was really forced on Turkey after World War I by Ataturk. And there seems to have been uh, not a violent and not a quick backlash, but a, a turning back of that over the past decade and kind of Turkey searching for its own identity in, in a new region in the post-Cold War Cold War region. Uh, I'll take, I guess, one more question. Uh, two more questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How does Israel stand with Russia? We generally have good relations with Russia. Uh, Russia sees us not as a satellite in the sense that it's a country that it controls, but there are a million people who speak Russian here. Many of them have Russian citizenship. Um, during the Cold War, when it was the Soviet Union, um, even though they initially supported Israel's establishment, they very quickly became anti-Israel in a very deep way, and they supported the entire anti-Israel movement in the world. Since then, modern Russia, uh, it's, it's in their interest to be certainly on friendly terms with Israel. I wouldn't say we have very close relations, but they're good relations, and they try to keep a balance. Um, yeah. Um, so it, it's difficult to get a general idea of, of how the world looks at Israel, um, whether it be just in America or globally. Um, I know the news is probably not the best arbiter of that, but it, it seems, you know, France, England, all it seems many of these countries are not very pro-Israel. Um, uh, first, like, do you have any suggestions of where we can get a better idea of what, what, what's really going on and not just the hearsay and, sure. um, and what is the general idea? It's a tough question. It's a very tough question. Um, yeah, certainly if you read Israeli newspapers, you get the sense that everyone hates Israel. The truth is much, much later. First of all, most of the world doesn't care about Israel, right? Asia, Africa, most of South America could really care less. But Israel, let's say they're generally positive towards Israel. I said countries like India and China are developing all of a sudden very good relations with Israel. Um, that's one part of the world, I say. It ranges between, they kind of like Israel, it's not a very deep connection with Israel, they don't really care about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, they don't have a favorite, and I'm obviously generalizing there. Then you have the West, okay? Um, so there are countries in the West um, who, or I should say parts of countries in the West who are deeply pro-Israel, there are countries in the West who are mixed, and there are parts of countries in the West who were originally pro-Israel uh, because of what we call Holocaust guilt, 
but now that they see Israel as an occupier of another people, and they, they see Israel as someone who commits war crimes, they have very mixed feelings about supporting with Israel, and some of these countries become anti-Israel. I don't want to say countries, because in every country it's a mix, and every country has different levels of support or uh, hostility towards Israel. Like I said, the United States is overwhelmingly supportive of Israel. So even if you see anti-Israel protests, uh, certainly on campuses, and if you guys actually look at my website, there's a big study of what's going on on American campuses in regards to Israel. The website's danpfefferman.com. Very easy. Um, okay. Um, Canada, Australia, the UK, uh, on a governmental level, mo all, of what, all of Europe, to be, to be fair, on a governmental level, right, except maybe the Scandinavians, are very pro-Israel. Okay? But that pro-Israel that they're in favor of is a version of Israel in their heads, and that's the pre-1967 Israel. All these countries are opposed to what they call the occupation, right? They want a two-state solution. <coughs> um, and their levels of frustration and distancing from Israel will vary on what happens between us and the Palestinians, or what is seen as happening between us and the Palestinians. And some countries will rush to blame us more for a lack of uh, diplomatic progress. Some countries will rush less. <coughs> Right-wing groups in most of these countries will tend to be more understanding because they're very much anti-Islam and anti-terrorism. Left-leaning parties in most of these countries will be more critical of Israel. And I think that dynamic is pretty much true across all the countries that generally do support us. Um, Overall, the picture is not so bad. Israel still has relations, certainly with most of the world, and even with much of the Arab and Muslim world where we don't have official relations, we have quiet relations. So really, there's just a handful of countries in the world with whom we have no relations, right? Iran, Syria, um, maybe Libya, right? I don't know. In the rest of the region, even the countries that don't recognize officially, we have quiet, functioning, decent relationships with them. Um, that's your question? No? All right, any last things or? All right, so what I wanted to give you there, um, and I think you guys asked some really good questions, you guys have some good understanding, is to give an overview of how Israel looks at the region, how Israel looks at the world, the challenges we face, how the different conflicts or different actors in the region affect us, and I hope you guys uh, got something out of this. Thank you. Thank you. The website is danpfefferman.com, very easy.